Hello everybody, my name is Brendan Mitchell and this recording is on the flipped classroom and the how of the flipped classroom. Uh, yesterday I presented um, three 30 minute breakout sessions at Edutech uh, for day one of Edutech uh, 2017 and there were a number of people who reached out on Twitter and indicated that they had wanted to come uh, but the, 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 their previous session ran late and they couldn't get there and they wanted to hear more. So this is a recording of that presentation that I'm doing uh, here now in my hotel room. So uh, I Hope that you find this useful. So again, um, my Twitter handle's down the bottom, at C21 underscore teaching. Uh, my colleague who presented with me yesterday, Josh Aguillon, uh, he is at JP Aguillon. So feel free to reach out to either of us on Twitter uh, if you have other questions and you want to learn more about the Flips Classroom. Uh, and I have some links for some further learning at the end. So let's get started. So this breakout session was all about the how of flipped learning. Now beforehand, I sent out a seven minute, there about seven minute video, pre-learning video, which covered the why and the what um, fairly briefly. So if you don't, if you haven't seen that video, I've got a link to it at the end uh, that you can uh, access. In this, uh, this presentation, we'll go through the general workflow of a flipped classroom and uh, what that can look like. I've got a couple of uh, semi-live uh, demonstrations, um, some conversation about the technology that can be utilised. We'll talk about some specific subject examples, how you can flip specific subjects, um, some further learning options uh, at the end. Now, obviously, there won't be a and a Q &A in this video because it's a, it's a recorded video, but in the actual sessions, we did have some time for Q&A, which was excellent. Now, one of the first things that you need to consider when you are going to flip your classroom is whether you're going to curate, which is source videos from somewhere, or whether you're going to create, which is you know, making your own. Now, there is no right or wrong way to flip, and I want to make that clear um, up front. Where you sit on this continuum is entirely up to you, and it's quite common when you are starting to start by curating content. There are those who argue that you should only be creating, um, but there are potentially instances where that's not particularly necessary. I, I think somewhere, uh, somewhere around sort of here, personally, around here is I think where you know is a good spot to sit. Um, but the underlying question is all about relationships. Who owns the relationships with your students when they're watching the flipped object, the, the, the learning content? Uh, if it's your video and your head is in the, in the camera, uh, in, the, in the screen, then you have the relationship. If it's not you, then somebody else is having that relationship. So just consider that in the back of your mind as well. In terms of the workflow, this is kind of what it looks like. You obviously need some way to present uh, whatever it is that you are teaching. Now this could be a whiteboard, a computer and screen capture, uh, a forward board, which and if you don't know what a forward board is, uh, I will cover that uh, later on. Or it could be a physical action. You're recording someone actually physically doing something. So there's lots of options there. In terms of the capture process, um, a smartphone, a tablet, Easy, easy way to do it. You can uh, record directly from those these days and they're pr generally pretty good quality. Most of the uh, recordings that I do that aren't screen capture, I just use my iPad, um, which is really easy. The ClickView app has a record function that allows you to record directly into your ClickView account. Um, there are also screen capture software. I've just got two there. Screencast-O-Matic is a free screen capture software uh, that you can use from within your preferred browser uh, or you can download and use as well. It's free, but you get a little Screencast-O-Matic watermark or you can pay $15 and that watermark gets removed. Oop. Yep. Now, in terms of some uh, live semi-live uh, demonstrations. In the actual breakout session, uh, we did a screen capture using a slide deck. Obviously, the, this laptop was hooked up to a, a screen, presentation screen, uh, and we actually recorded a brief lesson. Now, I've done a pre-recording uh, here in my hotel room of that, uh, and I'll, I'll drop that in, I'll splice that into this uh, presentation. Uh, I've got a pre-recorded uh, screen cap using a document camera. Uh, we did a whiteboard live in the breakout session. I'm not going to be doing that because I don't have I don't have a whiteboard here. Uh, a forward board will cover, and I'll also show you a physical action video as well. So this is what we were looking at in the live demonstration in the breakout session, and I will now drop in the recording that I have pre-done for that here in my hotel room. 
So this part of the presentation we did live and Josh actually demonstrated this uh, on the computer and you can actually see it up on the screen in the breakout session. Now I'm recording this, Josh isn't here with me, so I'm going to kind of do this double recording thing where I'm recording through the iPad and also on the computer screen as well, so you'll be able to see both there. So we'll get started and we'll show you what this, uh, how this can work with you doing screen capture. So at the moment, um, the screen capture software that I use, Camtasia, is running. Uh, as we talked about in the breakout session, Screencast-O-Matic is a free version, uh, free, free screen capture software that is available and you can use that from within your web browser or you can download it. Uh, it's a free piece of software, but you get a little screencast matic watermark or you can pay $15 and that watermark gets removed. Either way, whatever's gonna be, uh, whatever's gonna work for you. So we'll get started with this, uh, with this short little lesson. Good morning, everybody. In today's lesson, we are going to be learning about adding with decimal points. Now you can see that I've got uh, $32.55 and $10.35, and I want to add those two amounts up. Now, I want you to pay really careful attention to the two red dots, they are my decimal points. Now, you can hopefully notice that they are directly underneath each other. That's the important thing. When we are adding or subtracting or multiplying or dividing with decimal points, we need to make sure that our decimal points are directly underneath each other. That helps to ensure that our units and our tens are directly underneath each other, and our tenths and our hundredths are directly underneath each other. So in this case, $32.55 plus $10.35. Now the first thing that we're going to do to make sure that we get the decimal point in the right spot is that we're going to put the decimal spot, decimal point exactly where we want it, where we're going to be putting our answer. So you can see that I've got my decimal point where I'm going to put my answer and it's directly underneath the other two decimal points. That's the really important part that I want you to understand. From here, we simply do our adding as normal from right to left, five plus five, five plus five is 10. Put down the zero and carry the one. Five plus three is eight and one more is nine. We've got our decimal point in place, so we move on. Two plus zero is two. Three plus one is four. Put my dollar sign in and there you go. There's our answer. We've added as normal, but we've made sure that the decimal point is in the right spot before we start doing our adding. And there you have it. That's all, that's, uh, that's all it takes. Um, that is a very short video. The actual lesson itself in that video, once I sort of cut out the bit, you know, where I'm sort of talking to this camera here and not to the actual lesson, it's about 90 seconds. It's not much longer than that. And it doesn't need to be any longer than that because there's only going to be one key focus, one key concept in that video, in that lesson, uh, in that explicit teaching I want students to watch. Okay, so I hope you found that useful. Live, it was uh, quite simple to follow and everyone could sort of identify just how quick and easy it really is to uh, screen cap whatever it is that you are trying to teach. Uh, now this particular video is a pre-recorded demonstration using a document camera. Uh, Matthew Burns uh, is primary teacher here in Sydney and this is a video that he has used for his class. And three, two, one. Welcome to Teach Together Try Low Technology Edition. And today we're going to be doing a bit of adding with decimals. And as you'll be able to see, it's actually pretty easy. Not much really changes when we add with decimals, guys. For example, let's look at money, which is a decimal. Let's say I've got $30 and 95 cents, there's my dollar sign, plus 12 dollars and 85 cents. So you can see how simple that is. He's just using a document camera and most document camera software now has a recording function as well. Uh, so that's all that he's doing. And he's up front, this is a low tech edition with his students, but that works for him in his classroom in the, you know, what he's trying to achieve. Uh, this is a uh, demonstration of a forward board, so it is a panel of glass, a low iron glass, so you don't get the green tinge. Um, you can see that there is a strip of LEDs in the top that face down, that throw light down through the glass, uh, that's held in a frame. Now this is a homemade version, I actually made this particular forward board at home under my back deck. It cost me $315 uh, and a bit of change in materials, and it was about three, three and a half hours of labor. It's actually really easy. The hardest part was actually sliding the glass into the frame once I had the frame constructed, and that was because of just the size of the glass, the physical size of the glass. Um, so I got my wife to help me do that. 
Um, but other than that, it's actually really, really easy. You make a great project for a senior TAS class. Uh, so this is Josh, uh, my colleague Josh, doing a uh, mathematics lesson. Okay. Hey guys, today we're going to look at the principle or the idea of converting between fractions and decimals. So we know a little bit about fractions, we know a little bit about decimals, but today we're going to look at how do we conceptualize them, understand them, and convert between them. Because when we're going to be doing addition and subtraction and multiplication, we need to know how to, diff how to uh, convert between the two. So to start off, I think the best thing to do is let's look at what do we know about this number. So I want, you, I want you to think, what do you know about this number here? So he's teaching, talking as normal as he would in the classroom, but the difference is that he's looking forward. He actually gets to look at his students. So if I'm watching this as a student, um, Josh and I are having a one-to-one -one conversation. He's teaching me, me personally, because he and I are looking at each other. Yes, it's a recording, but the relationship is still there. It's a much more powerful tool, and it feels more natural because you can teach exactly the way that you would, but you're looking at your student. Now, obviously, the student doesn't watch this live because obviously this would be backwards for them, um, but you flip this in, uh, in, in software, Camtasia, it's about three clicks, and we found a free app called Flip and Rotate, uh, which was on the Apple Store. Uh, that does the same thing. So if you're recording in your iPad, it will allow you to flip and rotate um, the, uh, the video so that it's correct for, you know, when you're watching it. Really, really simple. And this can be done with so many different subjects. If you have a projector, you can also project an image onto the forward board, which you can then annotate. So for things like biology, rather than draw uh, the DNA strand, why not project an image on and then you can annotate. Um, as I said, this one cost me $315 in materials. I have also seen commercial models for $6,500, So it depends entirely on your budget and what you want to do. Um, this one works fine for me. Uh, I've never had any problems with it, um, and it's a lot of fun. This is a recording of, I'll just turn the volume down on this one. There's no talking in this one. Uh, this is a P, this would be used in a PE lesson and I have actually used uh, this game with um, stage three and stage one students. So rather than trying to explain to my class how the game works and be pointing and explaining and talking and whatever else, record it being played. You know, have a group of students who do know how to play it, record it being played and show this class. This is the game we're going to be playing. You know, it's kind of like tic-tac-toe, which is three in a row, and you can see what they're doing, and they watch it through a couple of times, and they get it. It's easy. It's really, really simple. So this is a fantastic way of teaching anything that is hands-on, where there's a practical skill that you're trying to get across. So something like this in PE, how to, you know, how to play this particular game, um, yeah, this is what a fundamental movement skill looks like if you're in primary, um, if you're in science, you know, or any of your safety demonstrations. How to use a Bunsen burner without setting the school on fire. Uh, this is what this experiment should look like. Food tech, this is what different cutting techniques should look like. Woodwork and metalwork, this is how to use the bandsaw or the belt sander safely. This is what a tongue and groove joint looks like and this is how you make one. Anything where you're trying to teach a physical skill, record it. Because once it's recorded, you don't need to redo it again. Uh, unless something changes, which is unlikely. So if you record it once, it might take you, you know, the 15 or the 20 minutes that it would ordinarily take you, or it might take you five, but then that's it. You don't have to, you don't lose that five or 10 minutes again next year and the year after and the year after that, which means that when your students come into class, rather than spend a lesson talking about this is how to do this thing safely, you can actually do that thing, whatever that thing might be. So there's a lot of potential for that kind of thing as well, uh, for you know, physical action recording. So once you have recorded your video, once you've captured it, you need somewhere to host it. Um, ClickView allows you to host. There's you know, YouTube, uh, Dropbox, Google Drive, um, OneDrive if you're an office school. Uh, there are so many different options. You might be constrained. You might be in a school that is a um, Apple school or a Google school or you know, a whatever school. Uh, it might have to sit on the school network, the, sh the shared teacher drive. Um, you know, you might have particular requirements there, but there are heaps of options to host. All it needs to be is somewhere that you can get to it easily and that your students can get to it easily as well. Now, the next step from hosting the video is we need to make it interactive. Now, anyone can watch Spider-Man. You know, it's, I think it's a terrible movie personally, but anyone can watch it. It doesn't require anything. The most interactive part is putting your hand into the popcorn bowl and getting more popcorn out. That's it. 
you're not really necessarily engaging cognitively in what it is that you're watching. So by making the video interactive, which is embedding some questions into the video, it makes it more engaging for students, but it also means that they actually have to think about what it is that they're learning, what it is that they're hearing and seeing on the screen, uh, rather than just you know, hearing, hearing you talk. Uh, there are lots of platforms that do that. ClickView allows you to do that. Camtasia uh, also has an interactive function as well that allows you to do that. And there are heaps and heaps of other options online as well. In terms of getting the content to your students, um, your learning management system, you are probably uh, going to be required to use the platform that your school is using. Uh, there are some schools that I've been to where you know, we are a this school, and there are some schools where teachers have freedom of choice. So I'm not gonna talk too much about that, whatever, whatever is required within your context. And again, assessment, we want to actually be obviously assessing our students' learning. Now, whether you're assessing for learning or assessing of learning, um, assessment as learning, obviously that's gonna depend on what it is you're trying to achieve. Now, in terms of the interactives, any of the software that gives you the interactive function, embedding the questions, will also give, give you the analytics, the results from student responses. So why not use that data? Why redo a test when you've got some data from questions that students have answered? It really gives you that easy understanding of where students are at. <clears throat> in terms of workload, there are going to be some subject specific tools. So GeoGebra, for example, in mathematics, uh, FET Sims if you're in a physics class, sports equipment for a PE, it's a subject specific tool. You know, and then woodwork, metalwork, food tech, textiles, they all have subject specific um, tools, equipment. Um, yeah, and novel in English is a subject specific tool. Now, what we've been talking about so far is for the benefit of students and making it more interesting and engaging and beneficial for our students' learning. But what about our learning, our professional development as teachers? Well, you can flip your professional development in a lot of ways. I wanna talk about two really specific ones. The first one I wanna talk about is recording your lesson um, or your, your presentation. Now, at future schools earlier this year, someone that I know asked me to record their presentation because they wanted to be able to watch it back and analyze and reflect on how they presented, were they clear, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I did that and they were able to sit down and watch it. That was flipping their professional development. I could have given them some feedback uh, and said, yeah, you did this really well, you need to work on this and you also did this really well. That would have been fine, but it's more authentic and genuine if they were able to actually watch themselves present because you can't sugarcoat that. You know, I might pick out something that, two things they did really, really well and pick out one thing that they need to work on, but it's going to be more honest and more authentic if they watch their own presentation themselves. So self-reflection on practice is absolutely critical as a teacher for development. The other way of doing that is record it and then watch it with a trusted mentor uh, or a, a trusted colleague, someone that you have respect for. Uh, you know, there's a mutual respect there and someone who will give you honest feedback. You know, someone who, when you are beating yourself and saying, oh, that was terrible, they'll say, actually, no, it wasn't because X, Y, Z. And they'll be able to give you specific feedback about what it is that, was, uh, that went well and what it is that didn't go so well, if that's the case. Subject specific examples. So I've spoken a little bit about some of these. TAS subjects, any of your safety concerns, any of your safety demonstrations, how to use equipment safely. Um, techniques, this is a tongue and groove joint. This is a, I can't think of the names of any other joints in woodwork or metalwork, but any you know, specific techniques. This is how you use this particular tool. Uh, this is how you combine these two techniques. Um, in more academic subjects, uh, again, there are safety things, how to use a Bunsen burner without burning the school down, how to use equipment, modeling and experiment. But the really powerful part is where you can start to explain foundational concept. You know, Newton's first law of motion isn't gonna change anytime soon. So why not record a short two minute video that explains what that is and why that's relevant, how it applies to, um, you know, to physics. Because once you've made that video, you don't need to reteach that lesson because you've already got it. Uh, for PE, you know, as I've already shown you in the uh, previous video, safety, rules for games and sports, techniques and skills. So teaching uh, a year one, year two class this year, uh, fundamental movement skills, we were teaching them how to hop. Now, rather than me standing in, uh, at the front of the room and you know, stand like this and now bend your knee and push off and rah, 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 and, you know, and then trying to watch and copy, record the gun year six student who can hop brilliantly 
exactly how it looks and you can then play the video and say, okay, we're learning how to hop this week. This is what it should look like. And then you can have a conversation. What do you notice about how they're moving their knee? What do you notice about how when they land, uh, they then push off? It makes it much more fluid and much more authentic. Student feedback is really important. It's one of the uh, most powerful ways of student growth. But why not record it when you get a piece of student writing rather than go through, mark it, have a couple of you know, two or three word comments, uh, a few marks and crosses throughout the paper and then maybe a couple of sentences at the end. You are going through and you, you have some thought processes going on. Why not just get a document camera and record that whole process and verbalize that process? The student then might get a five minute video, a 10 minute video depending on the length of the paper and they can hear exactly your thought processes. When you get really excited about something they've done really well, rather than just write, you know, great job, exclamation mark, you can actually say, this is awesome, this is a really good demonstration of this concept, and they can hear the inflection in your excitement. It's more authentic that way. They'll actually know, oh, the teacher was actually excited about something that I did. That's a really powerful tool. So why not flip the feedback as well? Now there are two questions. This is an area that I completely forgot to address in the breakout session. Are you going to outflip or are you going to inflip? Now to clarify, outflipping is what people think about when they hear the term flips learning. It is sending the videos home, the videos get done, the pre-learning gets done before they come to class. That is what most people think about that you could refer to as the traditional model. The other option is the inflip, which is where you engage with the video uh, or the, you know, the learning object in class. Now, where you use e either of these is going to change. When you are first introducing flips learning, I would absolutely start with the inflip because you need to teach your students, you need to train your students to understand how to engage with the learning object, how to engage with the interactive questions because otherwise it's just, yep, yeah, here's a video, go home, answer the questions. Well, you haven't actually changed anything. And I would also explain to students why. We are doing this because it means that when we come into class, we will be able to achieve more. So in flip, uh, I see very, very commonly all the way up through until about year three or four. And year three or four seems to be the transition point where some teachers, some classes will be using in flip and some will be using out flip and some will be using a mixture of both. It will depend on the particular cohort of students. It will depend on the subject. So there's a lot of things to consider, but there's nothing wrong with doing an inflip because even if you are doing the explicit teaching through inflipping, while you might have 30 students all watching that same video, you are still free to spend more time working with the student who needs the additional support. So you're still getting the benefit of flipped learning. So starting to close up why should you flip it's all about getting time back learning time in class to have students engaging in active learning so for science have them doing more experiments in PE have them doing more games and activities in uh, English there are so many things you can do in woodwork in metalwork there are so many options but it's all about the extra time in class it's not about the videos it's not about the video it's about the actual extra class time that you get the extra time for active learning Flip learning is all about taking direct instruction out of the group learning space and putting it in the individual learning time and then using that group learning time for more effective, more active learning. And the technology is enormous. There are so many options that allow you to do this. I've given you a taster of a few ways of engaging with flipped learning, uh, a few tools that you can use. So what next? There are some links here for further options, for further resources. Uh, they're all tiny URLs that go to um, you know, different websites. Uh, template FL is a lesson plan template for a flipped lesson. It encourages you to think about the pre-learning and then it also encourages you to think about what you're actually going to do in the group learning space. So it's a really useful thing just to help you plan your first couple of lessons for flipped learning. 
Flip Start is a page on my website that has a huge list of resources um, and contacts for flipped learning. There are review articles from FlipCon the last few years. There's a link to FlipCon this year. Um, this video and the slide deck are on that website. There are contacts, teachers who are flipping on Twitter, uh, on YouTube. There are some other resources as well. Feel free to check that one out. The next one, Flipped Cert, is a link to the Flip Learning Certification Level 1 uh, program. It's about eight to ten hours of content, uh, depending on you know how uh, how many times you need to watch particular parts. Uh, really worthwhile doing. Um, I did it yes, you know, one hour a week, one module a week uh, over the last set of summer holidays. Um, absolutely fantastic. It was I think about eighty dollars uh, Australian, something like that. Uh, Flip G Drive is my public Google Drive that has Flip's learning resources in it. Uh, Click Flip is a webinar that ClickView did about a month ago on flip learning and what that looks like through ClickView. Click Diff is a video that we did on differentiation, a webinar that ClickView did on differentiation. That particular video focuses on how to make the interactive component and use that with your questions through ClickView. Uh, Click Culture is a webinar we did uh, yesterday morning on cultures of thinking. And the last one, FL White Paper, is a white paper that uh, ClickView published last year, written by Rupert Denton, uh, that talks about some of the research behind flipped learning. So I'll just leave that on screen for the moment, but thank you very much for watching. Again, feel free to reach out to me via Twitter. I am at C21 underscore teaching. Uh, you can also contact me on c21teaching.com.au, uh, which is my website. Feel free to reach out, but thank you very much for watching, and I look forward to chatting with you about your flips learning journey. Thanks very much.